Hello and welcome to Talkernet History, the podcast where we, Matt and Max, talk about works of alternate history, alternate history scenarios, and history in general. This episode, we're going to talk about the critically acclaimed 2015 Amazon Prime series, Man in the High Castle, as well as the book that it's based on, the 1962 Philip K. Dick novel. Yeah, I'm very excited to talk about this. Yeah, so we have both seen the television show. Mm -hmm. And to anyone listening, you should see it as well, because we're going to talk at length about spoilers. So yeah, spoiler alert. Yeah, yeah, as well as the book as well. So you should probably read, you should pause the vid this video and then read this entire book and then come back and now <laughs> listen to it. <laughs> All right, perfect. So we've both seen the series. Yeah. Just to give some background information about the series, it is a work of alternate history. It's set in the 1960s after the Nazis and the Japanese have conquered the world, the entire yeah. world. Mm -hmm. And For all intents and purposes, yeah. But the part that we're focusing on, the story focuses on, is America. America's been split in half. The East Coast and part of the Midwest is all Nazi territory, and the West Coast is all Japanese territory. And, and there's, there's a, a sliver of, like, basically like a neutral zone between the two. Exactly, yeah. That no, That's sort of lawless that no one really owns. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It follows a couple characters, most of them in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Frank Fink, uh, Juliana Crane, Joe Blake, uh, Blake. John Smith. Uh, John Smith is a sort of a new creation of the TV show, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That guy. That guy was not in the book. You see, in the book, almost everything takes place in San Francisco. Yeah, almost absolutely everything. The only thing that's set outside of it is Colonel Wagner. He goes back to Germany for a little bit mm -hmm. at the very, very end, and also Juliana Crane spends the entire time in Canyon City and its environs in the Midwest. So that's one thing that's a little weird is that Juliana never actually comes back to San Francisco in the entire book. Mm -hmm. She never sees Frank again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like they're separated and they never get back together. Yeah, yeah. And then you see really nothing of like the Nazi control part of the United States, which is which is different from the TV show, which spends an extensive amount of time in New York City. Yeah, yeah. And parts of New York City has been replaced with, like, these ridiculous giant... What do you call those? Those, like, the, the plans that Speer made for the new Berlin with all those just enormous yeah, yeah. buildings. Yeah, huge buildings, and huge concrete. And yeah, huge concrete buildings. But it's very well done in mm -hmm. that sort of way. And basically, they do they ever explain exactly... They talk about, like the Heisenberg device. So the Germans have developed some sort of um, atomic bomb. I don't know if they ever explained, they talk about the Germans invading, like, cause there's a character that mentions, oh, I was at Virginia beach <laughs> like, that, you know, um, but they never explain like exactly like how the Germans came about to win. I think the, does a book go more into it, Max? Cause I, I haven't had a chance to read the book simply. Yeah. yeah the, time. The, the book explains a couple things. Like for instance, FDR gets assassinated. Oh, that's um, the big divergence. Yeah. Yeah. The, wow. That's, that's one of the really big ones. They, they have a isolationist president, but this is important is that a couple things are, are pretty different between the setup in the television show and the book Yeah. In the television show. Hitler is still alive. Mm -hmm. In the book, Hitler is a gibbering madman. He's in a insane asylum suffering from neurosyphilis, and Martin Bormann is in charge of the Reich. Mm -hmm. in, but in both the television show and the book, there's a lot of jockeying and infighting over who's going to take over this country once uh, Bormann is dead. Mm -hmm. So in, like, in that way, the TV show and the book are kind of parallel. They kind of have a lot of the same things in them, mm -hmm. but but just slightly different. But yeah, it's so strange that in the book, Philip K. Dick's book, that, that Reinhard Heydrich is Reinhard, yeah. supposed to be the good choice for the next Fuhrer, which is just unbelievable. Well, I wonder if he just wanted to make a really interesting, like, like this is such a, you know, the beast. The blonde beast. The, the blonde beast, the man, with, the man with an iron heart is like, so, like showing how screwed up the world is, like to show like, this guy is the best option, apparently. <laughs> Bring us Peter Saras's Rommel. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, yeah. Rom Actually, Rommel's not in Man in the High Castle. All no, he all. is mentioned. Is he? He's mentioned uh, that DJ Qualls mentions something about Rommel. Uh, good old DJ he's like Qualls. Rommel. He's like Rommel's only like 70. He could take over. That's right. Yeah, the first episode. Yeah, yeah. 
But in the TV show, they do something different. They have Heydrich be the main. He's bad. like, yeah, you're supposed to be on John Smith's side. It's like, clearly. which is kind of which odd. Is cra- yeah, which is great. Cra- well, but it's interesting. Like, I liked what they did with the character development there too, where they they're giving they're setting up this issue for the second season with his son. Like, yeah. he's gonna have to confront this. Like, his son is gonna have to be euthanized or whatever. So, because mm-hmm. like his character just seems to go from like one success to the next, and then it's like, <laughs> ooh, dead stop. R- rug pulled out from underneath yeah. you. But the main, I think the biggest change is that in the TV show, the whole thing that drives it is this, the grasshopper lies heavy, which is these series of films that depicts a world in which the Germans didn't win World War II. But it's interesting how they dis- they, they talk about how, well, there's some like the ones that Juliana sees show the U.S. winning, but there's another one where Joe Joe Blake refers to seeing one where like Stalin is still alive in like 1954, 55 and the Soviets are dominant or something like that. So, and the whole mystery is who's creating them. Cause it's the man in the high castle is supposedly creating them. Whereas the grasshopper lies heavy is a book in the, in the book. That's and right. it's like openly in this, the, the, the films, like the Japanese, the Germans are actively trying to hunt down these grasshopper lies heavy films where in the, in the book, I'm pretty sure, isn't it like the book is widely distributed yeah. in Japanese territories or something like that. It's a, it's a published book that people read mm-hmm. all over the place. I think it might be banned in the German part, but they mm-hmm. still read it all the time. And in the book, obviously, The Grasshopper Lies Heavy is a work of alternate history. Mm-hmm. I mean, but what the funny thing is, is that it doesn't depict our world. It depicts this world where Britain dominates the world. Yeah. It's like a cold war between Britain and America, and Britain eventually wins and mm-hmm. takes over everything. Mm-hmm. Well, I like how they did the, that's an alternate history within an alternate history. Yeah, exactly. And it kind of implies that there's many, many parallel worlds, like that this world's not the only one and that, well, actually, like literally people end up jumping between dimensions. Does that? Oh. Yeah. Because you remember in the TV show at the very end, Mr. Tugomi is like looking at a necklace and then suddenly he's in our 1960 San Francisco. So like that's weird <laughs> yeah it's never actually fully explained how that happens well i'm may, maybe in the second they're doing a second season so uh hopefully they'll explain that yeah, well, it's a I great way to end a, a season but boy what a hell of a cliffhanger to end on it, it is um it's like i'm going to guess there's going to be no scientific explanation for it i think it's just going to be like a dreamy mystical kind of thing because that's how it is in the book mm-hmm. he's like meditating and like looking at this thing and then suddenly he's someplace else mm-hmm so yeah they also talk about how the the grasshopper lies heavy is a way out like dreaming of this different world is yeah, your, yeah. is your gateway to going to that is different your true world. escape yeah and then you said it was something about the uh, robert Childan's dinner Remember, oh yeah the yeah, client, yeah the japanese clients which is like one of i think one of the best you know scenes in the whole tv show just yeah super well done yeah yeah like of all the things that they've changed and they've changed many many things mm-hmm. i'm very happy that they kept the dinner scene between children and his clients because that scene's fantastic he goes to these people's house he's eating their food and he's trying his best to be like as as much of a sycophant he's trying to like play to what he thinks they're going to like and Uh then they just do not like it at all they're like what they're 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 just kind of disgusted by him because because he's like super racist and he doesn't like the type of music that they like and he's also like he's secretly very attracted to the wife and it's just, I, I think it's its great in the TV show. It, they do a very good job of showing, and it really sort of drives the plot on. But Because Children's like a major character in the book. Yeah, less so than the TV show. I mean, he yeah. plays an important part, but not so much as in the book. But um, overall, I have to say is I really liked the TV show. Yeah. And I was so glad. I was a little bit wary at first, because I obviously saw like the, the ads for it and stuff like that. And of course, it ever caught everyone's attention because it had the Statue of Liberty given the Hitler salute. And <laughs> I know that actually caused some kind controversy in is it new york where they put them on buses maybe that's right they uh they didn't put they had like these subway cars where half of the subway car was japanese themed and the mm-hmm. other one was nazi themed mm-hmm. they didn't actually have swastikas but it was pretty it pretty was clear. clear what they were trying to do yeah, yeah. There. people were not happy about yeah. that also the uh statue of liberty giving the nazi salute that's in the uh that's in the spike tv it is uh pilot and i'm sure it's in more alternate history i mean that's yeah. true yeah well, so far, there's no Mount Rushmore with Hitler's face on it. So we'll have to wait till season two so we can see if that's in there. <laughs> Goodness, I hope not. But overall, like the production quality is great. Not campy at all. Very yeah. well done. I think we've mentioned before is that this sort of this whole Germans conquering America during World War II is just not a feasible alternate. I just don't see how this could have feasibly happened. Yeah. But 
the thing is, is that they do such a good job with this. Yeah, so yeah, it's the basis for this, but they don't overplay it here. But I mean, yes, it, it's what makes this world this world in this TV show, but it's more a story of individuals in this world, which I think is the way to do it if you're going to go with sort of a, a divergence like that. Absolutely, yeah. I, I, I'm i just absolutely thrilled by the amount of money that was put into this, mm -hmm. the risk that was made to make yeah. an alternate history television show. Yeah. Like, that must have been insanely risky, and I'm glad that it's actually seen success. Yeah, well, they got Ridley Scott to back him up. He's the executive producer, which absolutely, is great. Yeah. But it just overall just really well done, and it's entertaining, and it's just a good TV show. Like, it's, I think... I think it's just a very well done television yeah, on an episode program. to episode basis. Yeah. Episode to episode basis. It's like it's very entertaining. They they get the story going very well, and they obviously streamline part of the book that to, to help make it into a good television show. So I've really I've really liked it, and I'm really excited because I think it's a good sign for yeah. alternate history in television. Because any basically, I know there's previous attempts. We're not just talking about like that that Spike TV thing, <laughs> but but about but like with sliders and other shows like that. You know, people have tried. There's that like, film, Confederate States of America. Yeah, yeah, but I think this is this shows that if you if done right, you can make a really good TV show based on alternate history. Yeah. And I think part of that, and maybe for history buffs like us, we may just have to accept is that they have the historical divergence, but they just don't focus on it that much. Because yeah. I think if you maybe get too far into the historical divergence, then that maybe is where it starts breaking down. Yeah, I, I guess when you're doing an alternate history kind of thing like this, the divergence has to be really clear. And mm -hmm. every scene that you watch, it has to be clear that this is a totally different world for it to be a compelling and interesting kind of alternate history thing. Because mm -hmm. it, if you don't do that, this is just a normal story. Like, this is, this is not alternate history anymore mm -hmm. to the average viewer. They don't recognize it as something that's like this mm -hmm. new, different world. So I guess you could technically make the argument like most movies are technically alternate history they, in, <laughs> in a sense. I mean, yeah. they unless they're clearly saying the world they're in is different from ours. So... I think they do as, as, as good a job as anyone could have done when you have a divergence like this and just making it clear and building good background on it. Something that I really liked was there's a scene where Frank is talking with uh, children in his mm -hmm. store when he's trying to get them to make the fake antiques. He's like, can you tell the difference between these two pocket watches? Like one is like regular and one is worth an incredible amount. And he's like, well, one of these was in Franklin Roosevelt's pocket the day he was assassinated. And that's the only mention of that. But I like that because that's the way they would have, in, in a world like this, that would have been unspoken unless it was in a situation like that. I think sometimes they, they force these changes where someone will be talking and for some for no reason they'll just be like, oh yeah, remember when FDR was assassinated? Like, or, you know, something like that. Whereas, like, I like how in this, these people know the world they're in. So, so stuff is revealed as you go through mm -hmm. rather than it being so someone having to like do exposition and they do it without having a fish out of water like somebody constantly asking questions about like oh where's fdr what's going on here oh, yeah yeah why and isn't I, kennedy president now i don't understand yeah 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 and that's the problem when you have like time travel stories or stuff like that is that people are like wait you know what year is this why is it this not this not this whereas this is just like well this is the world these people live in so of course this is not right confusing to them or new to them and uh hitler i guess hitler's gonna be in the show next season yeah old, well because he, he implies that he's the man making all these movies or at least collecting them yeah that's certainly different from the book i'll yeah. tell you that yeah uh, which is why i'm so interested because when they're like they're literally like he's the man in the high castle and he's literally in a high castle in a castle oh my god you're right at the end <laughs> i hadn't so, thought about that yeah i didn't pick it up the uh, first one i'm like wait that is like a high castle I Which like, makes, but it, I need they need to explain that because why on God's green earth would Hitler be releasing all this? Stuff? So, but yeah, that's a lot better than in the book because in the book, the man in the high castle is just some guy. It's a it's a writer, and what he does is that he uses the I Ching. Mm -hmm. He throws sticks and stuff to figure out what he should write next, oh. and then he just does whatever the oracle tells him to well, do. Well, that's sort of like Tagomi, really. Oh yeah, yeah. Actually, in the book, everyone uses the I Ching. Like everybody, it's like the thing that's all over the place. Like, Juliana uses it all the time. Like, she's way into it. And also, another thing I really liked is that, okay, so in, like, that episode where Juliana meets that guy on the dam, and then he... he throws she, him off, yeah. Yeah, throws him off. Something very similar to that happens in the book at the very end. But it makes sense. Like, it's a situation where it's different, but it's absolutely the sort of thing that could have totally happened. So it's like it's like this TV show is an alternate history of the book, which is an alternate history. Yeah, which has yeah. Oh, oh my God! Oh. <laughs> I, I I really like that. I really like the way that they 
did they that. They managed to do that, yeah. Overall, job well done, Amazon. So glad they have another season coming. I will be watching it. Yeah, it absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, this, this Man in the High Castle success is great. I mean, we could totally possibly see more alternate history series mm-hmm. come out in the next couple of years. Absolutely. I think, I, I know I'm probably not the first person to have said this, but Harry Turtle's Great War Trilogy which oh. is the, the books where the, it's part of those nine or ten books about the South wins in 1862 and then goes on. It's independent in the U.S. and CSA fight World War One and World War Two and all that. It's perfect for a TV series. Yeah, because it's a very long story, for mm-hmm. one. It's, it, you got tons to work with. Two, it's very emblematic. There's so much stuff that you could do to make it very clear to the viewer, like this is a totally weird and wacky world, totally separate from ours. Well, make all it very you, visually interesting. Well, all, yeah, all you need to do is for a TV spot in it, you would have soldiers dressed like American soldiers in World War One, but they have Confederate flag armbands or they're carrying Confederate flags or could have a tank with a big Confederate flag going forward. Right, exactly. You know? Like, like just like the, the advertisement for High Castle showing all these emblematic American and images but they're all twisted and yeah, yeah. changed like you totally do the exact same thing with that tv show and I, then, I think that's an awesome and, idea and then also like washington dc sees a lot of fighting in that because it's right across the river from virginia so um, the first book great war american front you literally see guys dressed as world war one soldiers carrying a confederate flag like charging towards the white house huh. <laughs> so like there's a lot you could do, and I think you could simplify that enough because World War One offers so many variety of stories. You could do someone on a ship, you know, soldiers in the trenches, people on the home front in either country. You could really do a lot of good stuff with it. And it goes past World War One too. Right? Yeah, it goes through the interwar years into World War Two, and all. I think 1945, 46 is where it ends up. The Atomic Age, stuff like that. Yeah, and it does get to that point. So that could be a good TV show. You can make Guns of the South and do like an interesting like a TV movie or a movie. Yeah, yeah, but you know, it'd not be a big you mentioned. Movie. That I think that World War thing, even though I hasn't, I have not read it. It sounds more interesting than a Guns in the South TV show. Oh yeah, it would be much better, and it would also like avoid all the sci-fi stuff that we <laughs> were complaining yeah. about in the, the bad alternate history episode. <laughs> There's tons of stuff out there if you wanted to do time travel related stuff, but I really would yeah. like to avoid that. You know, I guess if if you could have the patience and someone willing to invest the time and money, like some of those Peter Saras stories, if you could almost do some of that stuff broken out in more of like a traditional history documentary format would be interesting. You know who you would go for that? Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks loves historical stuff, especially World War II era stuff. He'd be a great executive producer for that kind of yes, thing. Yes, absolutely. I think. You just would have to spice them up. They'd have to be more character driven because yeah. they're very broad. Those Saras anthology stories are really good, but they're, you know, they're not really, they don't follow individuals. They're, yeah. they're sort of have to be broad in scope and that makes sense. But I think you have to think of something that has very stark differences. Yeah. And exactly. that's why the Great War one is just so perfect because it's like the images are close enough for people to recognize them, but at the same time, no, like that's not right. Mm-hmm. Like, that's alternate history. Yeah, yeah. So I think that that's definitely something that they should look into in the wake of uh, Man in the High Castle. And hopefully, yeah. I would assume someone else is looking into stuff like that. I kind of feel like for the next series, they would probably have to not make it World War II related because I think that yeah. you might be kind of hedging in on their territory there, kind of doing the same sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I just I think World War II is so recognizable. I That's mean, you true. could do like something like a, a world in which Americans have lost the Revolutionary War. You could probably do something like that, you know, resistance, okay. whatever. Oh, yeah, like yeah. That. Uh, what is it? That uh, uh, Richard Dreyfus book, The Two Georges. The Two Georges. Well, but I mean, not, maybe not like, that one specifically. No, but. because that's like steampunk and just yeah. kind of strange and everyone's dirigibles. Like, <laughs> oh, God. Why? I don't More know. Why? I just don't know why. Like, <laughs> like, just as a quick side note, why people think like any society that has the ability to develop powered flight would think, like with airplanes, <laughs> would think it's better to stick around with the rituals because other than for a, f- a few things, like if you want spectators to like be high up above like a stadium mm-hmm. and going around slowly, it's pretty good for that. But they're not, not for transportation purposes, are pretty useless in comparison to an airplane. Hey, Man in the High Castle has got dirigibles in it too. And some of the promotional material. And promotional, but I don't think they ever, they, they stick pretty close to the technology is pretty much like 1960s-esque, yeah. which makes sense, as it would, because yeah, yeah. these cultures would not stop developing. Hmm. Actually, in the technology. book, like, the Nazis are on Mars and the moon as well, and Venus in the 60s. Which uh, is, yeah, maybe that's a little that's, ridiculous. That's a little ridiculous. 
Especially because, like, to, to actually have a colony on these on these planets is like Venus. ridiculously hard. On Venus, it's like it's like yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, for one, it's like boiling hot, and on Mars, it takes it takes literally three years just to get there one way. <laughs> like it's a oh, boy, oh, whatever. Geez. Yeah, and I'm I'm actually super glad they didn't include that. Yeah, that was a. I mean, little... if they if they had been like German astronauts have landed on the moon, like okay, yeah, I could have got that. Yes, yeah, and then that actually happened. In the and then 60s. we could have our uh, our man on the moon with the Nazi flag thing <laughs> that we have to have that trope that just keeps on <laughs> popping up on the internet. Just I mean, I figure if they're gonna do it, that's who knows. No Amy 262s in this. <laughs> exactly. None, none that they mentioned. That's right. That's probably how they won. That's probably how they yeah. did it. <laughs> it's, it seems to be every single time. As long as you have these jet fighters, all your other weaknesses <laughs> are forgiven, <laughs> apparently. No, they made the Amy 263, and that's how they conquered the entire world. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> also in the book, they uh, dam the Mediterranean Sea. They, they put a dam on like around Gibraltar in between Spain and Morocco and then they drain almost all of the Mediterranean Sea to make farmland inside of it. Wow. Yeah. What? Yeah, it's a re and it was like a real proposal in real life. Somebody wanted to do that. Obviously it was going to be really hard to do that, but <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. There's a, there's a couple kind of neat stuff in the background of that book. I, I like that book. It's worth reading. It's worth reading. Yeah. It's strange though. Yeah, well, that's, that sort of comes with the territory. Yeah. I think that's about it that we had for it. So uh, this is Matt signing off. And this is Max signing off. Have a good day.